Manufacturing Voices event. This is the future of food and beverage. And I know I just called it a panel discussion a second ago, but this is really a live podcast. That's what we call a panel discussion after 4 p.m. when we have beers. So <laughs> doing a little recording today. So maybe this is your first time as part of a live studio audience for one of these. Maybe this is your first time at Rheingeist as well. But welcome. We hope this is a, a good learning experience for all of you. And you know, we're going to be talking about the future of food and beverage, but what does that mean, right? We'll cover a bit of modern maintenance, we'll cover a bit of, you know, recruiting the next generation, the people that fuel the future of this business, and we'll talk about how important it is having a great community to help drive that as well in this discussion. So there's a lot that goes into the future of manufacturing and the future of food and beverage manufacturing, but we're going to give you a little sampling today. We're going to be up here for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to try to save about 15 minutes for questions as we get into it. But maybe most importantly, I'm excited to introduce our excellent panel of guests. So we will go down the line. On the far, on your far right, we have Cole Hackbarth, Director of Brewing Operations at Rheingeist. We also have uh, Larry Hecker, Hygienic Design Specialist at CBT. Then finally, Jeremy Saunders, Corporate Maintenance and Training Manager at Sugar Creek. So we have a wealth of knowledge, a diverse set of knowledge up here. Let's give them a, a let's raise our glass to them to start off. And I realize I didn't introduce myself yet. My name's Chris Lukey. I'm, a, I'm the host of Manufacturing Happy Hour, a podcast that's like TEDx meets how it's made. We talk to industry leaders like the folks up here today. Um, about the topics that impact the manufacturing world, the way you talk to someone is if you were having a beer with them, right? No buzzwords, let's move away from the big language and let's just get real as if we're having drinks at Rheingeist like we are today. So you can find Manufacturing Happy Hour on all the popular podcasting apps, iTunes, Spotify. Um, but with that, you're actually part of a live recording today. So in the spirit of Manufacturing Happy Hour, we got a couple icebreaker questions up here. So. Jeremy, we're going to start with you. So, you know, Sugar Creek, the company you work for, is described as an innovative, diversified, and flexible food manufacturer. And I'm curious, you know, what does it mean to be a flexible food manufacturer? Describe it as if we're having drinks with one another. Yeah, uh, so one of the things that John did as part of his, his vision for the company is, is that flexibility that you're talking about, and it's the ability to meet whatever random design, custom design that any customer has that comes to him with a need, uh, that he can rapidly do it. And this is even before we really ran into like a lot of supply chain issues. Uh, Sugar Creek literally has, you know, mothballed manufacturing equipment stored in multiple locations throughout Ohio, uh, Kansas, uh, and, and Indiana uh, that he can pull from. And so, you know, if all of a sudden you do need to pivot to a new design, we probably have that equipment. So you're not eating all this lead time to put in a new line to do something unique. Um, and it doesn't just stop with the equipment itself. We have teams inside Sugar Creek that that's literally what they'll do is, you know, they can wire up an entire system uh, from scratch as well as write the programs to execute it. So it, it really is anything that, that you can envision they can do um, and, and execute for you. So I think that's really ultimately the flexibility that you know, you provide your customers is, is to do those those random oddball jobs. Can we make this happen? Probably, because it John sounds, likes to be able to do anything. Yeah, and it sounds like you're already operating in the future a little bit if you have that type of flexibility, where in the past it's like you set up that line, and that's what that line is for years to come, right? But you have the opportunity to change quickly depending on, on the product. You know, Larry, I've, I've got your icebreaker question here, and, and you have an interesting title. I haven't come across this title before, and that could just be me, my own inexperience, but... What does a hygienic design specialist do? How do you describe that to someone as if you're having a drink with them at the bar? Well, since we're in a bar and we're having drinks, <laughs> it's an Perfect. easy way to start it, right. Um, basically, a hygienic design specialist, my job is to help customers either build or redesign existing equipment to make it more cleanable uh, for running food products. So uh, essentially making sure that they can run products safely, avoid product contamination. Um, and generally what I try to do is make the designs as simple as possible because the fewer parts uh, you have on uh, a system, uh, the easier it's going to be to clean. And it's also going to be way more reliable. So that's kind of my, 
my job in a nutshell. I love it. So simplifying design, making manufacturing more flexible. Cole, my question for you kind of eases us in to the, let's say, the first topic of our discussion today. And, you know, maybe you can do a little myth busting for us as we transition into this. Because when I think of a craft brewery or when maybe a lot of people think of craft breweries, it's like, hey, how do you leverage automation? I think a lot of people think of it as a very hands-on type, uh, type of operation. I think you have a unique perspective and can bring a unique perspective since Rhine Guys started much smaller than you are today and have grown into really one of the bigger regional names in craft brewing. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, certainly we, we started uh, very handcrafted um, and very manual with a, a much smaller system uh, the way honestly most breweries in the country are um, of the 9,000 breweries operating in the US. There's only 100 that are our scale or larger. Um, so yeah, it, it, it starts out small and we've been fortunate enough to be in Cincinnati that we very quickly. There was kind of an untapped beer market here um, that enabled us to really scale very, very quickly. Um, and with that scaling, obviously, everything can't be manual. Um, once you're running 24 hour shifts um, and you're into true, true shift work and, and manufacturing, uh, manual just doesn't work. So we do have a lot of automation um, in brewing and packaging. Um, and it's really about, about taking not necessarily the, the hands out and the, and the crafted aspect out. It's just simplifying the manual labor and the jobs that doesn't take skill to do um, and letting automation handle that instead so that our brewers who are very skilled and very intelligent can think about how to make beer taste better and think about new beer styles and think about new ways to, to handle modern process instead of just yeah, so focusing on the craft rather than all the work that, that goes behind it that automation can kind of take, take charge of. So, you know, we, we want to talk about one of the things that kind of sticks out to us when we're talking about the future of food and beverage is, you know, moving from, let's say, reactive to more predictive maintenance, right? And Cole, I think you're probably the right person to help us start this part of the conversation, right? When we think of food and beverage manufacturing, um, one element is moving away from that reactive maintenance or that tribal knowledge, as a lot of us call it, right, to more predictive programs. And, and can you share what that journey has been like for Ryan guys? Because I think you've got some great examples of what that looks like in play. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the growth was very, very crazy in the early days. Everything was reactive. Uh, most of my day was just spent putting out fires. Um, I was the maintenance team when we started. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a mess. Uh, on call 24-7. I could pretty much count on getting a call at 3.30 in the morning because the packaging line we were running had fallen apart. Then it's pretty much guaranteed I was going to get a call. Yeah. Always at 3.30. <laughs> there would never be an issue at like 4 p.m. Or at 8 a.m., it was always 3.30 You could in the at morning. least start setting your alarm clock for that. Then. Oh, I, I did, yeah. No, my, my wife knew, yep, I'm going to get the call and off. So, um, yeah, so, you know, even from the early days, because we were forced to grow so quickly, or not forced, I should say, we had the opportunity to grow so quickly, um, th there was a big, a big pressure to get a predictive maintenance program in place so that we weren't so reactionary, um, especially working with specialized German brewing equipment, you know, things that it's engineered, it's planned out of Europe. If you need a replacement part or you need some kind of spare, it's six weeks, depending on customs, if it gets hung up. Hung up. Um, so it was, it was tough in the early days and, and downtime when you only have one line is, is true. The whole brewery just shuts down, whether it's packaging or brewing, the whole thing grinds to a halt. Um, so kind of building in a program, a big set of spare parts was, was key to maintaining momentum to grow like we did. Um, and investing in that was, was, was a big part of that. Um, and it's, it's something that a lot of craft brewers don't, don't understand until it hits them, right? Um, I, think, I would say most of the industry is still very reactive. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious, is that, you know, because if we're seeing automation become more accessible to like smaller companies, do you think part of this is just craft brewers psyching themselves out saying, hey, this isn't for me, I can't do something like this, or is it other constraints? I'm curious what you think the realities of the situation are. Absolutely, yeah, most craft brewers are not manufacturing professionals. They're not necessarily engineers or, or food manufacturing people. Um, most of them are home brewers with a dream, right? A lot of ex-lawyers and doctors and, you know, business analysts. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of people that just love beer and they decide to throw everything in to, to make a business out of it. So I, I think the industry as a whole um, started out bootstrapping a lot of things and just kind of figuring things out on their own. And then as the industry has matured over the years, obviously professionals have stepped in to help grow and scale a lot of these big national breweries that we all know. Um, but there's still, you know, every, every week there's a new craft brewery opening and it's some home brewer with a dream and somebody that just loves craft beer. Um, so I think it's cool to see kind of the collaborative nature of craft beer because it's always kind of been very open and we kind of share ideas and, and share how we do things. Um, and, and a big part of that has kind of been educating these new brewers on how industrial manufacturing works and how it works at scale. And that you don't have to be a big 100 million, 500 million, billion dollar company to access this stuff, especially with the way automation has, has kind of come into accessibility and how it's become a lot more affordable and a lot more scalable up and down. Um, so I, I think I think it's been really great to, to be able to plug that in. And well, well, Jeremy, I want to get your take on this as well, because unlike, you know, ex-lawyers and these people that don't have manufacturing backgrounds, you know, you've also been successful at, you know, uh, you know, implementing programs and you have the experience, right? So, you know, I understand Sugar Creek is going through your own like modern maintenance journey and that you personally, um, you know, have done this in past roles, right? So I'm curious, what has the journey at Sugar Creek looked like for you so far? And maybe share this from the perspective of like the goals you've set out and where you've gotten to so far. Uh, yeah, before I jump to that, uh, one of the, the things that you brought up uh, was about getting things from overseas. Uh, for anybody who's new to that, there's some of the European you know, brothers and sisters where they have vacations for an entire week as a country. So there's, there's times where literally a, a country vacation or holiday can your supply chain. So it's another thing to consider all as well. Of August. Yeah. <laughs> the whole month. The whole month of August. They shut down, they go to the beaches in Italy. Don't even try. <laughs> but um, when it really comes down to implementing your, your predicted programs, I, I think a lot of us, we end up making mistakes because it's, it's a huge, you know, pie to try and, and eat up one time. So we're not sure how to dive into it. Uh, but I would highly recommend anybody in this room who's considering it or you're starting it or wherever you're in the process that really needs to be focused around your end user. If you're not going to focus your predictive maintenance program around your technician, um, then it's it's going to most likely fail. Um, and we're in this day and age where everyone keeps trying to launch these programs. So there's a good chance that your technicians have actually already experienced this. So now you're trying to unjade somebody that you really need to execute this. So really, I would start there. I, I will go ahead and jump into the Sugar Creek part, but definitely mm -hmm. focus on your maintenance technicians. Are they empowered? Are they supported? Do they have ownership? Do they know what right looks like? So some of the things that we've done with Sugar Creek is it's actually tied to another program. We've launched a subject matter expert program to where we do really in-depth custom training with our OEMs for our technicians and tie that with our predictive tools uh, that we're, we're tying in. So now I, I have a thermoformer that's down. There's a vacuum leak. Right? Instead of taking that whole line down, I can use an II-900 that CBT provided for us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but now I can look for those, those air leaks and troubleshoot it. And I go, okay, I know where this air leak is. I know how quick I can get to it. I can minimize my production impact because I'm not taking the whole line down and then trying to figure out where to start from there. So the II-900, we're getting into motion amplification, which is a really cool tool if you haven't looked into it. Um, we're doing IR. Uh, and if you catch a theme here, really the theme behind these is these are really easy programs for your technicians to pick up. Those who are used to predictive tools, right? I get it. Uh, vibration. Vibration is king. It's the best. That's what you'll run into as arguments. 
But is that the best thing to get your technician to buy into? Uh, probably not. And that's, you're, you're trying to get the best thing, but you're not getting the buy-in. They're not supported. They don't know what right looks like. So I would focus on them, get into those simple ones, IR. I love the advice there. And, and uh, Larry, I'm looking for your perspectives as well. Feel free to piggyback off the great things that Cole and Jeremy just said. I also want to ask you about, hey, how does a strong reliability program uh, impact this and impact a modern maintenance program? And like, what are, what are the first steps that people should be doing? Um, well, I, th I think the most important thing is to make sure everyone's on the, on the same page between management, maintenance, production, QA. You have to have buy-in from all four or it's gonna be a disaster. Um, a, a story I'll tell is I was in a food plant and we were working on redesigning a conveyor um, and the QA person tells me, I asked a question about uh, positive swab test and, and, and are you having issues on this conveyor? And, and uh, she tells me, she goes, well, when we have a positive test, we don't tell sanitation where it's at. And I said, why don't you? Well, we don't want them cleaning there because they know that's a trouble area and then not doing anywhere else. And I said, well, then how do they know that that's a problem area that needs to be improving? And so I, it was no communication between the groups. And if they would have communicated, then uh, the maintenance and the engineering team could uh, go in, look at that, redesign it, uh, so that it doesn't become a cleaning issue and now a, a potential product contamination issue. So if I would say, number one, make sure it was in a buy-in. Number two, uh, like Jeremy said, there, there are tools out there that will help you on your, your journey with the preventive maintenance stuff, whether it's vibration, heat analysis, uh, air stuff. Um, there's a lot of tools out there and the prices on that stuff continues to come down. It's not getting more expensive, it's getting cheaper. And then finally after that, you need to make sure your network can handle all the data that you're collecting. Uh, because if you don't, don't have anywhere to put that data, it doesn't help you. So it's, it's words in a book. If you don't read the book, they're just words. So that's what I would say is the beginning steps. So some themes is around, you know, good opportunities for getting started as well as, hey, the price threshold is coming down. Automation has become more accessible for a lot of the companies out there, even the small and mid-sized manufacturers that might have previously considered it out of reach. You know, we're going to switch from, you know, the maintenance, the mechanical, the automation side, and more to the people side at this point. And Jeremy, I think you're the perfect person to start us off on this one because I know Sugar Creek is doing more than a few things really well when it comes to recruitment and onboarding. I'd love if you could share first, you know, what you've been doing with like the FPSA and uh, their FIT program to attract talent. Uh, yeah, sure. And so for those of you who don't know, um, the FIT program from FPSA, they're, they're taking candidates who are entering in the maintenance field and they're putting them through like a 13-week boot camp specific on food industry, food safety, and the equipment that, that's in our field. Uh, so that you, you are getting basically an apprentice level uh, type of technician joining your team. Uh, and I think it's very important that when we talk about retention and bringing them on, remember back to our days when we were those young technicians for those of us who went that tree, or think of those around us that we were close to and, and understand the difficulties of starting your life. So some of the things that we've done to, to really help those technicians transition to Sugar Creek is we do have uh, apartment buildings that we own uh, for our FIT program. We actually own a house uh, that's exclusive to the FIT students to share um, and it's fully furnished. And <laughs> when John, and, and John, by the way, for those who don't know, is the owner of Sugar Creek. When John furnishes a house, you have towels, like and it's, it's furnished to that level um, because they are joining a new career field. They've put everything on the line. They don't have a whole lot to help them get started. Um, so that that helps them with that transition, that reload to it. Uh, to go beyond that, he expands it to really all of his employees to where you know we're teaching life skills. Um, life skills from even running a banking account, um, as well as industrial training. We're releasing our own um, electrical training coming this Monday uh, that we've developed internally um, that's really focused on our technicians. So everything from 
really maintenance focused training to day to day training that a lot of people joining the workforce, they don't have these life skills. Uh, and John and his family has really invested significant capital into that to uh, empower people. There was the interesting study, how many people are engaged in the workforce. I think it was just 28% for 2022 are actually engaged in what they're doing and they just don't feel empowered. They don't feel respected or invested in. And this is something that you know, Sugar Creek has really done, that that whole family um, has really done to help improve the lives of their people um, to really keep that retention in. And, and Jeremy, I think one of the impactful things that you mentioned when we were first talking is a huge part of retention is how well you do the onboarding, which mm -hmm. is a huge impact on that. You know, you shared a lot of great stuff there already. Is there anything else you do, you know, to help to continue to retain your talent once they get there? Sure. Um, so just to touch real quick on the onboarding piece again, I, I think this is an area probably all companies could really spend a little time focusing on because onboarding shouldn't start the first day to come to work. Um, you know, even your interviews need to have a positive impact, even if you're not going to, you know, eventually take them onto your team. You always have to have that positive engagement piece when you're done with the interview, but send them a letter, tell them how to get to your plant. Don't just give them an address. Tell them how to get from the parking lot into the building, who they're going to talk to, what their initial schedule is. Think of everything that you would want to know and then follow up with them after you've done so. What didn't we tell you so that you can continue to grow the program? It's simple things like that. Uh, we have a lot of internal programs that we've built that help really rapidly get people uh, competent, right? Because it's meantime the competency that we really want to try and address. And then the retention impact of onboarding, there's nothing more impactful to retention than onboarding. Some of the other things we do, they're, they're pretty common and, and relevant throughout the, the industry, what your engagement pieces look like. Uh, we have something called a stay interview. So it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the employee and the supervisor. And then on the maintenance team, we do an additional one called a pulse survey. And this is where our corporate team sits down with maintenance teams in small groups of three to five people. And then you know we'll talk about different things that are impacting them because we may get different answers uh, from the technicians than what they would one-on-one -on -one with the supervisor. I'm typically the one who does that, and I can actually take that, put some data points together and say, hey, here are some, some highlights, some lowlights uh, that we, we probably want to address and then give those action items out. I mean, you've got a ton of knowledge and experience around it, this area of retaining talent and how do we keep the talent and things like that, which I think a lot of people can learn from, you know, whether they're here or listening to the podcast afterwards. but. Cole, I want to flip this over to you because you work in craft brewing, right? I'm wondering, I think a lot of us are feeling the pains of finding the right talent and retaining that talent in the manufacturing world these days, but I'm interested to maybe have you do some myth busting again, right? People think working in a brewery is cool, right? Of course, everyone's going to sign up here. Hey, free beer. I'm going to stick around, right? I'm curious, are you, you know, what, what are you, what are you seeing? Can you share the realities of your situation when it comes to, you know, attracting and retaining talent? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it was lawyers and doctors quitting their jobs to come make beer for nothing for years. Uh, <laughs> that's not necessarily the case these days. Uh, I think the last few years in particular, everybody would agree, things have changed. Um, cost of living has is, is skyrocketed, and the number of people that can afford to work for fun and to chase a dream has dropped dramatically. Um, so in the early days of craft, yeah, you're in it because it's craft and you're not in it for the money, you're in it for the beer. There's just not that many people that can do that anymore. People have to survive, they have to pay rent, um, they got to take care of their kids. So the, the industry is, has kind of gone through a, a reckoning over the last few years of, hey, you can't employ people on a dream and an idea. You need to give them what they need, benefits, pay, um, you know, good work-life balance. And that's kind of where we've, we've pivoted. You know, we, we can still say craft beer is fun. It's great. You know, we still entice people by saying you're making something that's really cool. We can go out to the tap room after our shift, interact with our customer one-on-one. -on -one. They're in a good mood because they're in a craft brewery drinking beer, right? You know, we're not in a hospital dealing with people that are dealing with really harsh situations. So craft beer is still a, a, a great industry, but we're not immune to the pressures of every other industry out there. Um, and again, it's, it's about focusing on the individual, 
What are their needs? What can we do for them? Craft beer is a relatively small industry. Mm-hmm. When you talk, you know, food manufacturing or industrial manufacturing, we're a small company um, compared to Sugar Creek. And, you know, so when, you know, post COVID, everybody kind of ramped up all of their entry level wages and, you know, the, the kind of the base wage just kind of skyrocketed. The industry had a hard time keeping up. So craft has really struggled to, to sell that story of like, beer is cool, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, so yeah, so we've, we've, we've had to double down and, and really focus on work-life balance and say, Hey, we recognize you have a life, you have a family. We need to be flexible around that instead of asking workers to be flexible around us. Um, and that's kind of the, the narrative that we've carried forward that, that has seen a lot of success despite not being able to, you know, match rates overnight of Amazon and, and some of these companies that are just pay enough and people will show up. Yeah. So we're hearing work-life balance. We're hearing about the importance of onboarding. You know, Larry, you see a lot of different manufacturers in the work you do. And maybe a different spin on this is we will bring it back to automation on this. How how are you seeing automation help when it comes to addressing like the challenges that people are having around talent and retention and everything that goes into this situation? Well, I I think over the years, people always assume, well, uh, automation is going to get rid of jobs. And really in, in, in the pandemic has really highlighted the fact that now automation really isn't getting rid of jobs. It's filling in for people you can't get. Uh, I had a customer who just, a food customer that just put in seven robot arms to stack boxes at the end of the line, which each one got rid of three people they needed. They didn't let people go. Mm -hmm. It was empty jobs they could not fill and now they used automation to fill those jobs they couldn't so anyone that were doing that job in-house now they're free to do something else that's more productive so really where i see the automation is is look for the jobs where it's highly repetitive it's simple and how can we automate it so that person doesn't go brain dead doing that job 40 hours a week. There's, you know, you, you, the, the people that uh, your good employees are always going to want to be challenged, always want to look for more responsibility. Those are the people you want to keep and you don't want to have those people doing a, a repetitive job um, over and over again because they'll just burn out and, and go somewhere else. Uh, so what I see automation in the future is basically filling in where you can fill in with people. And, and the kind of comment on Jeremy, I've told him many times, their company is so unique when it comes to attracting talent and, and how do they get people in the door and how can they provide things outside of the doors and the walls of that factory to still help their employees. And, and it, it's, uh, you know, some of their plants are out in the middle of nowhere and you think, well, how are they attracting people out here? There's not a hundred people that live around here, let alone 500 in this plant, and yet they're able to do it simply because they're they're creative. They think outside the box when they're when they're doing that kind of thing. You know, speaking of thinking outside the box, or maybe speaking of food and beverage specifically, right? We've we've told everyone we're talking about the future of food and beverage. We've covered some topics that no doubt impact food and beverage, or you know, that impact all manufacturers, I should say. But Larry, are you seeing unique opportunities in the food and beverage industry specifically or unique challenges that you can talk to just from the breadth of folks that you see? Um, you know, the, there's always, uh, every year there's going to be more governmental rela- regulations that people are going to have to follow. Uh, the, the latest one in the, in the bakery world is sesame seeds are now uh, considered a... Um, a um, no oh, allergen. Thank you. Thank you. It, really? Yes, it is now an allergen. So if you go into any bakery that's running buns for a restaurant, 
you know, if they're running McDonald's and they're running Big Mac buns, uh, of course, there's sesame seeds on it. Well, as those go through the line, sesame seeds get all over. Well, if they're running now a product that doesn't have seeds on it, they've got to clean everything out. And again, sesame seeds two years ago wasn't considered an allergen. So again, that's a, a, a government regulation that now the food people have to deal with. So it goes back to, okay, how do we make our plant forms more flexible, more cleanable, so that if we've got a change from product A to product B, how can do we how can we do it quickly and efficiently to minimize downtime? So again, um, that's a unique challenge because you know you're, if you're you know building transmissions for a car, the government's not going to suddenly come in and say, hey, you you can't use aluminum on that part. It's just not going to happen. But in the food world, there's going to be regulations coming. Yeah. And, you know, the, the different products, CBT sells, uh, things that we sold in food plants 20 years ago, we can't do it now. Mm. Uh, or we don't want to do it now because, uh, you know, particularly FSMA, the, the new food uh, regulations, requires manufacturers to be much more sensitive about the, the cleaning of their plants. Real quick show of hands. Does anyone out here have a sesame seed allergy or is this, is this really? Okay. I was going to say, I think I was my, I, I wasn't sure if we'd get any hands raised, but I figured this was a good thing to put in place. But what I like about it is it ties into what you were talking about earlier. Um, Jeremy with flexible manufacturing, right? If you have flexible manufacturing and you can quickly make the transition over from something that has sesame seeds to something that doesn't, you know, you can still be competitive rather than having it gum up the, you know, the whole process of, you know, continuing to get product out the door. So good reality check there. Um, as we finish this conversation, the, the last topic, it's kind of a fun one, right? Because um, we're here in Cincinnati, right? I'm, I'm a guest here in Cincinnati today. I'm originally from St. Louis. I live in Milwaukee, so I'm rounding out the German triangle here. But, you know, I, I wanted to do something to, uh, to kind of celebrate Cincinnati manufacturing. And kind of the last question to go down the line for everyone is, you know, hey, what characterizes the Cincinnati manufacturing ecosystem? And what can others learn from the great things that Cincinnati, the Cincinnati manufacturing community is doing? Because a lot of people that will listen to this podcast afterwards aren't necessarily from Cincinnati. So, you know, what makes it great and what can others learn from it? We'll go down the line. Cole, you've got home field advantage here at your uh, manufacturing facility at Rheingeist. What would you say to that answer or that question? Yeah, I think it's uh, the diversity of industry um, and the amount of support for those industries. I've been in brewing all over the country. Um, from the Pacific Northwest all down the West Coast and, you know, depending on where you're at, getting parts, getting support, getting people that know what they're talking about and knowing how to help you in a pinch, going back to that living a reactive <laughs> maintenance lifestyle, um, having somebody that you can call and say, hey, this is what's happening. What can you do for me? And getting an answer is key. Um, and I think Cincinnati, just because of the number of different industries that are here and the amount of, of support that goes along with those industries and companies that just specialize in all kinds of, of manufacturing and, you know, like CBT and these, these kinds of companies that just, I don't know what you do. We'll figure out a way to help you. Um, and I think that's what makes Cincinnati just awesome. Like, doesn't matter what you're into, you'll find somebody that knows how to do it. And you've been around to a number of other regions as well. Cincinnati is not like the first spot that you've called home. No, I, I came out here from LA uh, previous to that. Um, obviously LA has got some manufacturing and the port, like everything's flowing in and out of Long Beach. Um, so if you needed anything from China, it was on a boat somewhere in the port. <laughs> um, but before that I was up in, up in the Northwest. I worked for a, a brewery kind of in the uh, Columbia River Gorge that was outside of Portland. Yeah, if you had something go wrong, it was a week to get anything, um, which is is devastating to a, a regional manufacturer. 
Well, thanks for bringing your brewing experience to the Midwest, and we're glad we were able to bring our, you know, shorter lead times to you now that you've moved to the Midwest as well. I love it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's made my life and my home life much, much better. Larry, you're up next. What, uh, what makes the Cincinnati manufacturing ecosystem great, and what can others learn from it? Well, kind of pile on to what Cole said is uh, there's no one industry that dominates this, this area, the southwest Ohio. I mean, we have everything from food manufacturing to automotive to material handling to distribution, uh, which I think is really unique to this area uh, compared to a lot of the other parts of the country where a certain industry will dominate uh, everyone in the area. And I think what that allows for is that there's a lot of people here with, uh, with a lot of knowledge of different stuff. and, and for people that don't live around here, uh, no matter what your town is, I think there's opportunity for you in the area because whatever industry you're in, there's going to be something related to it here. And, and I think that opens up uh, a world of possibilities here for, for people maybe outside of this area to, to look here to, to, to establish roots. It's really nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, unlike Cole, I've lived in the tri-state my whole life so this is really all I know uh, but I go elsewhere and, and it just doesn't have the same feel as Cincinnati I think the other thing is uh, like you said this is a German town it you know it, uh, and there's still that German feel that the, there's a lot of hard-working people here that it just permeate permeates and you just can kind of feel it in your bones when you're when you when you're around here love it Jeremy, take us home. I'll share that, uh, just like Cole, I too am from LA. Uh, so you got two people up here from LA and I just wanna say anyone from LA listening to this, why in the world are you going to Texas and Arizona? It's hot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I lived in Texas for four years, I know. Come to Cincinnati, <laughs> believe me, it's worth it. I've had several transplants, but um, they did really well talking about the industry. What I'll do is take a little bit different approach and talk about the people uh, a lot of have worked in these multiple different type of industries. So they're, they're just so much more well-rounded when you do run into those issues on how in the world are we going to fix this? And all I know is Jim's going to go grab a welder and then, you know, hey, everybody let's just walk away and let Jim do his thing. It's something that, that you know, our workers really are able to do. You know, we, we do have a lot of high-tech technicians that we train and bring here a lot of good colleges, a lot of good training programs. I know CBT has a, a Rockwell piece to really help with that technology training and skill, uh, especially with robotics. But there's a lot of rural, a lot of farm areas where it's not broke. It's just, it's, it's only been welded once. We can weld it again and they'll get it up and running. And it's just really cool to work with people like that. And for the rest of you listening, it just ties into the whole onboarding. They'll let you earn their trust. Um, I've worked in a lot of different states and launched buildings for Amazon and like New York and out in Fresno. I don't know why I ended up in Fresno, but I did. Um, they'll let you earn their trust here. And, and that's just such a key thing. That's not available everywhere. There's a lot of people who just as a culture don't allow that to happen very easily. So take advantage of it for sure. Well, one thing that I was just thinking about is I was just living out in California for a long time before coming here. So somehow or another, three out of four people that ended up on a manufacturing panel in Cincinnati were all people that came back from uh, the West Coast. So no, a lot of great things um, that I sense here that I've learned from all of you. You know, it, we're, we're at the end of our formal part of the panel discussion. We're actually going to open it up for Q&A here in a second. Um, so if anyone has any questions right out of the gate, any hands raised or any, um, let's, uh, we'll start over there. Yeah, so, so my question is around gender balance in manufacturing. So I've been working in manufacturing for 15 years. It's a very male dominated field. What can we do to get more women into the manufacturing field, engineering, just manufacturing in general? So if you guys don't mind, I'll take that one. Yep. Uh, so that's something that I've been personally very passionate about. Um, when I did work for Amazon, I brought in the first female technicians uh, into this node for Amazon. Um, and it was a very key part of the air hub that's launched here was that was a part of our onboarding that we were tracking. And then with Sugar Creek, I'm actually doing an interview for our FIT students here soon and there's two female technicians in it. What you really need to take a look at is why are women not wanting to come to the industry 
you know, let's be honest here, we don't make it easy on them. So keep that in mind. How do we make it easy on them? And there's a lot of things where we don't, uh, all your safety strategies, your gears and stuff like that are actually intended for your, your male size people, you know, so taller, stronger upper body and women are at a disadvantage to do it. Um, also, especially in, in this area, it's just been so dominated that that's a male line of work. So that, that stereotype still exists. So you really need to get some marketing out there. Uh, some of the things we did was we had women that were in Amazon go uh, to like job fairs, internal job fairs to try to get people to transition from our production labor force into, it was an MRA program um, to, to bring in uh, female technicians that way, because it was just, there's not a whole lot in the labor market um, with the, the female population. So you kind of got to create your own. You can do that through your apprenticeship programs. So the FIT program that we're doing, it's one of their key focuses. We actually had that discussion. Uh, so find programs that do that, but then help empower those programs. Uh, put some some female managers out there talking to your female production workers. Say, hey, have you even considered this? And it may seem impossible to them because they may have been told their entire life that they can't do it. Well, no, it's not impossible. We have a training program for you, right? Make it easy for them. Review your safety stuff and make sure that it works for all genders in your, your business. I think I rambled on that a little bit. Oh, that was a great question and a great answer. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I'll quickly add to that uh, real quick. I've been to some workforce things, and this is something that the Manufacturing Institute has talked a lot about. Uh, but there are some barriers for women because childcare primarily falls uh, to the females. So things that you can do is to provide um, resources for childcare and also adding to what Jeremy was talking about earlier with flexibility. I don't know the exact stat from the Manufacturing Institute, but if you give them the flexibility to either pick up or drop off their children uh, from school, uh, that just a small thing like that will allow them um, to alleviate some of that home stress to be able to, to get to work and not worry about whether or not their kid's getting safely dropped off or picked up. So there are a lot of things. The Manufacturing Institute also has some really great um, literature on that. So next question. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So the first thing I want to do is I actually want to uh, commend Cole on his role with Ron Geist because as all craft brewers, they start out with the love and the passion. That's what they do. They brew a product that they know that they like, that they love, and they hope to God that the rest of the world enjoys it. And I will say for uh, a fact from experience, I spent a lot of time in New York and other places on controls projects. And when they wanted to drum up business in their bars, they would promote themselves as providing Ryan Geist Cincinnati Brewery beers. Uh, so Bomber's Burritos in Schenectady, New York, beautiful place, great great place to eat they uh promote you guys heavily and they just they draw flocks from it so awesome job you guys did great and uh it's not an easy task and you did it so uh congrats uh my main question was for mr jeremy here uh as someone that uh is yet another proclaimed joe jordan trainee uh he says he trained you anyway. Uh, how do you promote yourself beyond that to where you're at now? Because you clearly are very astute with your practice. You are very well versed and uh, you're actually well above the level of a lot of people in what you do. So how do you bring yourself to that level? I completely made up, went along. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the world is full of people uh, who find problems. Um, and some will try to solve them, uh, but some will just give up easy. And it's just really, no matter what the problem is, don't be afraid to jump on the hand grenade, even if you don't know how to solve it. You know, have that ownership uh, and just drive through it. Make sure you're updating everybody as you go through it. Just kind of own that whole process and figure it out. Um, I, I read something recently where it says, hey, if you send 100 people into battle, 10 people shouldn't even be there. 80 of them are just targets and nine of them are soldiers and one of them's a warrior, you know? And it's kind of like something along those lines where really 90% of the people, they see those problems and they're gonna stop at the first sign of resistance. 10 of them don't even realize there's problems at all, right? But it's, it's really those handful of people uh, who will jump onto those because 
we all sit there and talk about these are opportunities and they really are. Um, but just don't, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Like, grab that bull by the horns. If you fail, you fail. I feel I'm surprised I'm not fired from everywhere I've worked. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done things that nobody knew how to do. And here's the thing, I didn't know how to do them either. And it's actually kind of cool because nobody could tell me I'm doing them wrong, <laughs> right? So just don't be afraid to really take on those problems. And like, I don't know what the answer is, but I'll figure it out. And then at the end of my comment. <laughs> <laughs> First off, thank you guys. Uh, the question is for everyone. Larry spoke to Jeremy with Sugar, Pl Sugar Creek's plants being hundreds of miles outside. How do you, how are they getting all these people in here? But I think Jeremy answered with a pretty obvious answer. They invest and buy in to their techs and people and such. What do you think the hesitancy of other companies to do so is? Well, um, it, Sugar Creek's unique in that they think outside the box. And I think for a lot of other companies, no one else is doing it, so why should we? Um, and I think in this day and age, um, you know, throwing another $2 an hour on the hourly wage isn't going to do what you think it's going to do. I think there's a lot of uh, the companies where I call on where, uh, you know, one of the questions I ask just about every time I'm in a plan is, how are you guys doing people-wise? Yeah, uh, and a lot of people, oh, we're short, we're short electricians. We're, we can't get production people in here. We can't do this, we can't do that. Uh, and then there's a few companies that only say, oh, yeah, we're doing really well. And those, those are the companies that seem to treat their employees better and, and more uniquely where you'll go through the lunchroom and they've got sign-ups for some uh, baseball game or uh, a picnic coming up or a trip to wherever. And those are the companies that seem to are, are having a lot less time, difficult time attracting people or the, the companies that aren't just looking at the jobs they're offering as an eight to five or a nine to five job and, you know, We'll take care of you in these, this time frame, and then you're on your own. It's the ones that, like Callie was saying, uh, child care in the morning or uh, allowing for flexible shifts. Uh, you know, the, the people, uh, another thing that just kind of popped in my head are the people that have very rigid shifts also seem to struggle a little more on the personnel part of things. And I see a lot of people where, you know, particularly during COVID, they kind of staggered their shifts a little bit so that it didn't have a rush of people in all at the same time. And they, people really liked it if, okay, I don't have to be here at seven every day. I can get, get here at eight. Now I have time to drive my kid to school. Or I can come in at six and I can leave at three. Now I can pick up my kid from school and things like that. So I think uh, really be creative just because other people aren't doing it doesn't mean that's something you shouldn't do. Tying on to that, you talk about there's a lot of companies who don't jump into this. I, I think it's important to maybe take a minute and understand what you're seeing from their perspective, right? A lot of boardroom meetings, a lot of just constant meetings and updates, and it's all data tables and points like that. Um, is everyone taking time to actually humanize your, your people? And I think that's something that sometimes people miss. Um, up at that level. No one's actually making a conscientious effort to humanize their people. And until you do that, you, you will kind of run into those problems. It is worth your time, regardless of what level you're at, to go walk among your people. Let them know who you are. John Richardson has a whole bunch of plants and he walks them and the technicians know him. They've shake you know, his hand when he comes around, the impact of that. And he understands and he remembers his people because of it. Um, that's something that I would definitely encourage if you're, if you're running into that in your own company, help humanize them. I'll add one thing to that as well. Um, the thing that I'll add is that probably about, I don't know, 15 episodes ago, I was talking to an individual named Jason T. Ray. He runs a company called Paperless Parts. Um, but he summed up, I think, this conversation in terms of a lot of the great things that Larry and Jeremy just mentioned. 
he said, hey, we, we know for a long time we've had like a talent gap, right? Or a skills gap, right? We have a lot of different words for it. And he described it as if you know something has been a problem for five years, 10 years, 15 years, at what point does it go from being like a skills gap to a leadership gap that actually addresses that? And I think the things you get just mentioned around, you know, childcare in the morning, um, all the things you're doing for your folks at Sugar Creek, Jeremy, like those are the tangible things that companies need to be doing to care for the whole person, right? It's not just the hours of eight to five. How do I make your life better outside of those hours as well? So I thought that was just, you know, it's a real simple thing, but it changed the way I thought about it, right? It's like, we know this has been a problem, right? So why do we keep blaming this skills gap or this labor gap? Let's look ourselves in the mirror that are leading these teams, that are leading these companies and organizations and say, hey, what are the things that we can do differently? And I thought those were great, very specific things that you both just offered in that regard. I think we have time for one last question at this point. Um, my question is basically around uh, young professionals in manufacturing. So one thing that I've seen myself and a lot of my peers struggle with is connecting with uh, senior technicians. And I'd be curious if you guys have any advice for um, young professionals, particularly engineers like myself, uh, for connecting with these technicians who have vastly more knowledge than we do. Um, but we have some knowledge as well. And, you know, we want to coordinate with them with no disrespect to their experience while at the same time trying to add our value. The Catalyst for my thought was, you know, Jeremy, your background and Cole, your mentioning of being the uh, one man army of maintenance. So that was kind of the reason that this question came to mind. So curious what you guys think. So, yeah, that's that's a common issue. A lot of people have had to work through um, the ones that I've seen really navigate it well uh, are the ones that you approach the technician from almost a student standpoint. Technicians want to be respected. And then a lot of times we come in with, with young engineers who are very brilliant at what they do, uh, but they haven't had all the years of experience on how to actually execute it and make it work. And a technician has that. And so what you're talking about is just, right, uh, you guys will end up butting heads pretty hard. But the ones who navigate well, they'll come in and what do you think about this? Bring them in as a partner, not as I want to do this. Actually steer them where you want them to go, but kind of do it from behind. To where they feel like they're a valuable piece of the process to go through and that will typically work really well with them um, even if you don't have anything in mind for them ask them to go show you something just because you're in the area like hey explain to me how this works right and i think that's a, a really great thing that you can do um, if i go way back to when like i didn't have any gray hair uh, i used to be an aircraft mechanic for raytheon and we had these brand new aircraft, T6 Texan twos. They were coming to us for about 2.6 flight hours. And uh, we would have these changes that engineers would make. And we, we couldn't get them in the aircraft. And they would redraw it, redesign it, tell us that we even had them come out to come show us technicians how to do it. And they couldn't get it in. It all works out great on paper. Um, but I guarantee you, if, if a bunch of us boys from Alabama can't get it in that airplane, you're not going to either. Um, so eventually some places have gotten really good to where they actually take aerospace engineers and they teach them actual aircraft maintenance hands-on portions to help bridge that gap to really understand the differences too. Engineers are brilliant. You guys know you're brilliant. You make the world run, you really do. But so do technicians. It's, it's they're just a different type of intelligence. So do that. It, it's almost like the uh, patient doctor relationship or I'm sorry, the nurse doctor relationship, right? Go in as the nurse. Let them be the doctor, ask them their advice, go in that approach, because then when you want to do your idea, like, well, what do you think if we try this? They're more apt to listen to you because you're a partner at that point, you know what I mean? Not a competitor. Yeah, 100%. What, what Jeremy said, um, I will add on, be When I started in the golden age of craft, um, everybody wanted to get in, every job posting, there was, 50 young guys that were like, yeah, I want to make craft beer. It's great. You'd fly. Never hear anything. So it, it always took the ones that got in were the ones that followed up again and again and again and again. And remember, if people aren't responding and they're not getting back to you, it's not because they don't care or they're offended or whatever. They're busy, right? They're doing what's possible.
especially manufacturing, they're trying to get the equipment back up and running. They're trying to keep production going. They're trying to hit the schedule. So if you're trying to get something out of these people and trying to learn from them, you've got to be persistent and you got to just keep at it. And eventually, you know, they're going to remember, okay, hey, I've seen that name a few times. They aren't giving up. So I'm going to respond and I'm going to start a conversation because I'm tired of seeing the email and feeling embarrassed that I don't have time to answer it. And I wish I did. Right. And it's, it's just the nature of where we are right now. Everybody's busy. So just stay persistent, stay persistent. Everyone, excellent questions. We are at the end of this portion of our event, of our party, but there's still more to come. So um, I do want to say a few things before we wrap up. First, um, I was looking at everyone's glasses out there. We can't really do a cheers because everyone's glasses are empty right now from what I can see. Um, but hey, let's round of applause for our panelists. Larry, Good job, Larry. Jeremy. I also want to offer up a hand to Ryan Geist and the staff that's been taking care of us. Thank you for all you do.